You are listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of icmforum.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chris, and in this episode, we will dive into the nightmarish worlds of Wojciech Haas, the Polish master director who made a name for himself with his distinctive style that seamlessly blends elements of surrealism, generally dreamlike logic, and symbolism. It's tempting to call him one of cinema's great surrealists, but there's so much more going on under the hood as we are pulled into the depths of human anguish, or on the flip side, worlds of splendor and wonder. However, even with all his acclaim, There are really only two of his works that essentially everyone who loves cinema knows. The fantastical fairy tale, the Saragossa Manuscript, and his perhaps finest surreal nightmare, the Hourglass Sanatorium. These cinematic epics, one in stunning black and white that arguably counters the best works from Tarkovsky in terms of the visuals. The other, in slightly more drowsy colors perhaps, bringing us into a world of death and pain, perfectly encapsulating just the breadth of the realism of Wojciech Haas. But, but we're also tempted to go back to where it all started, his more realistic yet still anguished and dreamlike the news, his 1958 cinematic debut, and at least in my opinion, a masterpiece in, in its own right. We'll go through these three films in chronological order and may indeed bring up some of his other uh, films along the, the way because he has a vast and quite nightmarish uh, catalogue. Uh, Before we get there, uh, I would like to introduce my two absolutely wonderful co-hosts, Saul and, for the very first time, Carmel. And just ask both of them about their first experiences with watching a Haas film, what makes him so special in their mind. But as this is your very first episode with us, uh, Carmel, why don't you go first? Uh, just introduce yourself a little bit and uh, tell us why Wojciech Haas is a special director for you. Uh, hey, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I jumped on this episode because uh, I'm partly Polish myself. So I thought, you know, why not? Why not? Why not share some of my Polish knowledge? Given and I also read the read the books on which on which his films are based. And yeah, I mean, I've you know, I'm a cinephile since uh, <laughs> a fair amount of time and. As a 13, 14 year old, I was successively picking DVDs from my parents' uh, film collection. I would just pick DVDs one after another and Saragossa and the Sanatorium. I mean, we had the DVDs of both of them. Uh, the DVD covers, they're, they're obviously splendid, you know, very uh, attractive. So I just watched them on the DVDs when I was 14. Did they give you nightmares? No, no, not really. They were just a really fun, surreal ride. I think they're quite innovative and uh, very influential on a, on, a world, on a world level too. But it was nice to, after the fact, to read all of these short stories and novels and, and come back to his films now. But yeah, no, I didn't get any nightmares. Um, what about you, Saul? When did you encounter your first uh, house film? So the Hourglass Sanatorium and the Sagosa Manuscript are films that I've known about for, I guess, 15 or 20 years, ever since I first started getting into film. But there were two films that were never released on DVD in Australia. And when I was first getting into film, this is like way be- uh, before streaming. If I wanted to see a rare film, you know, I had to import it from overseas. So I never ended up seeing those two films until just one of them about a month ago, one of them just this morning. And the first film that I actually saw from Hass instead was The Noose, which I saw in January this year because we had a central European challenge on the forum and it was available stream online. So the news was my introduction to Hass. Wow, I'm surprised it took you that long to see any of his uh, films. The distribution in Australia really needs to uh, improve. And obviously, so from this year, you've now seen 
three of his films, uh, I believe. Like, what is it uh, to you that makes uh, Haas stand out as a filmmaker? Um, that's very hard to answer based on just these three films. I mean, if I went by the Hourglass Sanatorium, which I think is easily the best of the bunch, it's the sort of seamless blend between dream and reality and memory when the protagonist is going through different rooms and things keep changing up on him and he's sort of getting unstuck on time. There's a little bit of that in the Sagosan manuscript, but not nearly enough for my sort of preference as a film goer. The Noose was quite a different film to those. I mean, I guess there are some stylistic touches in there, but it is quite a different film, so I don't know. I mean, based on what I've seen, I guess maybe some of the fantasy reality blur stuff, but even with all those three films fairly fresh in my mind, yeah, I can't really pinpoint anything, sorry. No, no worries. Uh, what about uh, you, uh, Carmel? What is it about the uh, horses films that stands out the most to you? He has a very unique style of like fully displays with like his um, you know machinery and capacity for cinema. What cinema can do now, even though it's a book adaptation, he he, he really fleshes out able on all the levels of the films, and you can see in particular in the, in his la- latter works with with more um, with a, with a bigger budget, his costume and production designs are very very intricate. There's something about the camera as well that just is it's able to convey this like hypnotic uh, feeling that's so necessary for well these, these dreamlike films i mean all of his films in some ways they they, they deal with um time and there's a, a structure a perturbed structure of of time um exploration of altered temporality is what i think unites all of these films so they're just beautiful to watch and like you know really inspirational on that cinematic front for me it's a dual side of you know, having read having read the books on which these films are based, I kind of you know I'm, I find interest in com- comparing comparing the two and seeing how cinema can overcome overcome some of the problems of adaptation and enhance and and you know stimulate stimulate you on different different levels in different ways than than the books do. But it's yeah, it's a blend of all kinds of interesting themes and which we'll get into as we as we talk about the films individually like what you said about time because definitely i'd say in the two later films going to be discussing time is very important the other thing which you also mentioned was the costumes and production design so i thought i might just mention that also because both the hourglass sanatorium and the sagosa manuscript have very detailed dilapidated sets so it's not just like detailed sets but like they're falling apart they're in ruins and yet having those sets in there like that actually really add to the experience. Uh, what about you, Chris? What is it that really draws you into his films? For me, I think that the sets that you talked about, that's something that becomes more and more clear as one of the key things that makes Haas special. Uh, and that's another slight comparison to Tarkovsky and some other uh, you know, great visual storytellers. Like a lot of... Hall's greatest films, they stand out just because of the props he puts in, the way the rooms are set up. Like If you look at Saragossa Manuscript, for instance, you have the skulls, you have uh, cobwebs, uh, you, you have like these worn down halls and he really works with them and in some of many of his later films too like you can see how lavishly he decorates apartments how he for instance will even just shoot over plates with half-eaten food just builds and set up tension with this slightly different focus on details and just really lavish stylized worlds that uh, encapsulate a kind of dreamlike atmosphere and uh, if you look at the films he made after the Hourglass and the Torium, you can see he's also starting to, you know, really play around with the color. You kind of have these little smudges or lens plays that uh, make the films all feel a little bit different than most other films around. Like, you almost feel like you're watching dreams when you're watching a lot of his films. Um, this is present in his older black and white films, too. Um, I, w- I would say. Like, I, I love the news, and I, I'm tempted to say that he came out, you know, I mean, he came out swinging. It's a great first uh, film, but it doesn't feel as singularly hot as what he did from Saragossa Manuscript and later. 
you, you can still see that he, he's part of that larger Polish canon of great directors of the 60s. Like you can throw in Vida, etc. as well. They, they build visual tension somewhat similarly, but even then, like this kind of dreamlike atmosphere is very clear. And, and even in essentially all of his early films, they, they're more simple, if you will. They're more uh, dialogue-driven very often, but he still drives that tension. He still plays with these soft touches of surrealism and just creates an atmosphere that is different from what else was out there. And uh, <laughs> this, this might be a good place to uh, just start from the beginning uh, with the news and just share our, our thoughts on this, because uh, like, like I said, to me the news is uh, a bit of a masterpiece, not just a great first film, and uh, even more so, it's one of the most startling depictions of alcoholism I've ever seen on film. Uh, like many of his later films, it feels like a living nightmare, but it, even more so here because it is more down to earth. It's not as fantastical as the Hourglass Sanatorium or the Saragossa Manuscript. It, it feels closer to real life, just amplified a little bit, just tilted so it feels a little bit stranger, a little bit more airy as we follow our protagonist, uh, Cubas, as he tries to pass the hours until his girlfriend returns from work, will take him to the doctor, be prescribed pills and try to just get alcohol out of his system. However, as he tries to stay in his apartment and just stay away from temptation, the phone won't stop ringing, and as he escapes into the street, he is assaulted by invitations and just a long string of other triggers that may just push him over the edge. Uh, and a question for us viewers, as the tension just builds and builds and the downward spiral feels crushing and uh, inescapable is, you know, will he make it? Can he find his way out of alcoholism? Uh, what's your thoughts on this one, Carmel? Well, I mean, yeah, for me, what the news is a very, very accomplished uh, film debut, I think. And the, what's really interesting for me, I mean, this this week I reread the the short story in which is based, and we watched the film. And I mean, but the news, yeah, the news is is mad. Like the short story is by this uh, author Mara Huasco, who at the time, you know, and. In the 1950s, he he became quite a symbol of a, of a counterculture, you know, and, and he was a hip, cool looking guy. He had a very troubled life. He was struggling with alcoholism himself and and uh, going to hospitals and getting into fights and all, kind, and all that. But his writings very often accused of being kind of a brutal, primitive uh, reality. He was accused of kind of nihilism and all that. But somehow he became a symbol, maybe because he was very good looking. He's called the Polish James Dean. And there's two two <laughs> James Deems, and one of them is actually the the well the main actor for the, the Saragossa manuscript. The short story doesn't feel dreamlike in any in any capacity. It's very literal and down to earth. Uh, you know, we have his the, the 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 alcoholic as he struggles, as he's trapped in this and endless repetition of false hopes and this uh, cyclical pattern of being trapped in the same day, the same nightmarish uh, existence. He starts off the day hungover and he's like, yes, I want to, I want to, I want to try to quit this. I want to try to quit this. My girlfriend wants me to quit drinking. I have ruined my life uh, because of drinking. And okay, I just need to hold on to this, to this, to this, um, to this promise. I get the pill at six and that's supposed to solve all of my problems, right? That's the, that's the start of the, the path to recovery. But then, yeah, but it's, it's just. As he goes through his day, there's this statistically unlikely accumulation of triggers that makes it feel as if he was in a dream, where every kind of element that he encounters is a is a phantom, is a trap, is a is a threat, the trigger precisely for you know for him to start drinking again. It's a powerful, cute depiction of, of that, those kind of struggles. Now, there's not a lot of films that you can think about that just deal that have that very and it's so single themed and just really explicitly deal like oh this is this is a day in the life of addict i find it um, built up in a very nightmarish way in a sense it's very structured with uh, 
the appearance of all these successive triggers, being invited for drinks, being seeing people gossip about him on the streets as a drunk, getting into fights as a result of past drunken misdeeds, and just the, the actors do a splendid job in really portraying that kind of struggle. He's always like sweating. Stiffing, his eyes kind of sometimes they have this kind of manic look, sometimes really absent, and and he the the, the actor really yeah portrays this, this 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 these outbursts of anger really well, and I think it's a it's a very accomplished film. Yeah, you're completely right about the the way the actor portrays the role, and just the way he just seems to be more and more in anguish as the alcohol is leaving his system, and the, the uh, and the triggers uh, pile up. It's just really hard to watch, and it it makes the experience of watching him come to life in a way that uh, we're not really used to. It just builds up this really ominous uh, tension. Uh, what's your uh, experience uh, with uh, the news? Well, watching the news was quite interesting because even though I don't read up about films too much beforehand, I already knew going into it that it had quite a few comparisons to The Lost Weekend, which is just one of those absolute classics from Billy Wilder. And it was a hard film not to try and compare and contrast to as I was watching it. I guess my biggest takeaway would be the whole thing felt less nightmarish to me than The Lost Weekend, but I'd like to try and maybe judge the film on its own terms. So on its own terms, like Carmel said, the lead actor does a really great job with the role. And I thought also was really good in the, in the film was there were a lot of point of view panning shots so it's sort of in the middle of his conversation he's talking to a character in the middle of a conversation and his gaze would just wander around which sort of captures how distracted he's feeling and i guess how nervous he's feeling he doesn't want to fall off the wagon he wants to try and stay sober but different things are getting to him throughout his day the other thing which I found really interesting about the film is that when he leaves his apartment, like you said, Chris, after the telephone won't stop ringing and he wanders through the streets, everybody keeps commenting on how drunk he already looks and he hasn't touched a drop. So it sort of gets to the point where when he does actually, actually I don't want to spoil it too much, but it sort of gets to the point where the whole thing feels maybe a bit inevitable. Everybody's already saying that he looks drunk, then I guess, well, maybe he might as well be drunk. So I guess that's sort of sort of the nightmare about it, that people sort of like assume that he's drunk anyway. And he's got that sort of assumption that if he's walking in a funny way, it must be because he's drunk, because he's got the reputation. So I thought that was interesting. The point of view of photography was really interesting. Uh, really great lead performance, but I guess just overall, very hard to go into the film and not mentally compare and contrast to The Lost Weekend, given that I'd heard so many comments about that already before I went into the film. Yeah, it's a great comparison. I mean, I actually prefer it to uh, The Lost Weekend, but I haven't seen that film in a while, and I need to, uh, I need to give that a rewatch. Uh, but both are obviously really strong films. I do think that uh, the news manages to build up the nightmarish atmosphere more, but that might be also be my bias towards Haas and just seeing it in the context of, you know, Haas's nightmares and rewatching it uh, for this episode. <laughs> because then you kind of come in with that ex expectation uh, as well. Uh, one thing I, we haven't touched on yet, and which is uh, what I was really drawn to and captivated by this film on my rewatch is just how time works in the film. You start with him looking at a clock uh, on the other side of the street, ticking in towards eight as he uh, you know, sees his uh, girlfriend arrives in, in the morning. And she tells him you know, when she'll be back from work, when they'll go to the doctor, uh, how they'll sort it all out. And it, it's kind of like he has this mental clock where he's trying to just keep himself sober until six and you keep being reminded of time you see it clocks you have people asking about the time there's reference to when things will arrive and they arrive and it, it's also interesting just how the perspective of time changes i mean for a lot of the period of the film when he's kind of trying to stay away from alcohol um time seems to go very very slowly 
but suddenly there's a little time warp as well where you, you can kind of see he's disappearing into his own mental state and he's it's not been he's not quite sure what time it is we're not quite sure what time it is and then we get reminded uh, but you know when it, it, he's really close to lapsing suddenly time feels different again it goes faster and it becomes e even less firm just, I, I just thought that was a really interesting uh, touch in, in the film so as I worth mentioning is that obviously alcoholism causes the loss of time obviously in the sense that if you drink too many of these vodka shots at some point you, your brain just just shuts down right and it's a, it, the days blend into each other you can't really locate your memories in the past anymore and yeah there's a there's a lot of references within the film to dreams as well it's uh, the moment when the harmonist who, who says i can translate dreams and they kind of and kuba tells his dreams and he ends up just telling his life story and the conclusion of that is no worse dream than life and the worst thing too is that the, that uh, dream uh, interpreter the, the first thing he says too is like not to worry about it just have a vodka <laughs> not very helpful the way that time moves in the film too beyond just letting us feel how he's experiencing it i also feel like it moves us into his mindset a lot of our uncomfort comes from just watching him you know seeing his withdrawal symptoms seeing him become you know more and more aggressive and uh, like quietly unhinged snapping at people um looking uneasy etc but when you have that and you have the film itself taking us in these first of all these loops like you mentioned but then also having the time move in a kind of way where it disappears on us in the same way it disappears on our lead i think that really puts us almost as much as the film can into his experience of the world and uh, that's one of the things that uh, makes the news feel particularly uh, special to me yeah i agree about how the film really tries to like portray his his internal mind his internal state in the novel there's way more inner monologues and, and desperate flights of fancies and thoughts and excuses that you fabricate for yourself yeah, as, he, as he's walking on, on down the streets, you could always argue for a dream interpretation too. And it's like all the all the little the kids that he sees playing around uh, the phantoms and apparitions. There's a, in the in the book as well. He's something that's not included in the film is that he hallucinates passerbys actually telling him, "Have a drink. This will solve your problems." And there's this entire internal internal debate in his mind. Part of him tries to rationalize his drinking, and it's just this, it's a, his mind is a battlefield of forces telling him something else. I guess, I guess yeah, the, the film can be seen as a big warning, because at the end, well, well we're not going to spoil the ending, are we? No, probably best not to uh, spoil it. But yeah, like you said, there, there is this almost spectral aspect of a lot of his encounters. Like, he even meets his uh, first love. Uh, for the first time in well, well over a decade, and uh, it, it's just these kind of random encounters uh, that seems to kind of stray uh, credulity. That there's one which I'm not sure if I want to spoil, but it's this very symbolic moment in the film too, where he meets uh, his, his friend or acquaintance, and. Actually, I think we can mention, mention it, that early in the film when he's on the phone with these uh, various people calling him and they're joking about the pills, etc. he's going to take, and he says that the pill is going to get his autobus. And uh, the guy uh, he's on the phone with says, oh, well, autobus, and he starts laughing. And a little bit later in the film, he uh, meets this acquaintance of his on the street and he's you know, asking the same kind of questions and he, uh, Cubas gets more and more uneasy. And uh, at the very end, he asks, like, oh, what's the name of the pills? But before Cubas can uh, answer, his friend sees the bus and yes, oh, autobus. And he starts running uh, after it, he jumps on. And shortly after that, uh, that bus crashes. It's probably one of the most dreamlike elements of the film because it just seems to come out of nowhere and uh, it, it kind of just symbolically at least uh, if the bus that crashes is his uh, medications it kind of it, it indicates that it's going to be a similar crash that the pills won't work and that's what people are telling him too like the various people he, he never says he's trying to quit drinking to all of the people who suspect 
that he's a drunkard uh, or who just treats him normally. But all of them, they just kind of tell these stories about how you can't escape alcoholism. Um, it, it's kind of just seems like everything is doomed, everything is against him. This hope he has just keeps being stripped away more and more. And they also he even sees these possible symbols of his future, like there's these two older drunkards who are uh, white, desperate, and tragic, and uh, could be, like one of them even calls by his own name. So it, it, it kind of just sees, like he can kind of see his future, where he might end up if this loop continues to spin uh, for the next uh, decades. Yeah, the struggle is really... Uh, the film really, with all of its visual motives, the recurrent symbol of loops, of circles, of uh, spirals, it's just a straightforwardly downward spiral trajectory. The, and and, and the, the clock, if time, time structured on a clock, obviously uh, emphasizes this too. It's an endless repetition of a um, struggle against the superior force. And you, know, you have the individual level, but there's also a commentary on a wider social kind of uh, aspects and how alcohol is a social plague and there's this scene when he goes to a police station that's probably my favorite scene in the film and there's already a, an older man being, being escorted to his cell and he's like jerking about it like well i already know my cell number is it number one this time or number three this time and it's like and he's already drunk by by three or four o'clock at that point you know and sleeping it off in the cell. But it's a very tragic scene too, because he's like, uh, the, the police officer is saying something like, oh, who, who are you crying about over, over your drink this time? Is it your, your second daughter, your, your wife, your third wife? But he's drinking to forget, right? And the, the tragedies of life, of death that happen. And this is a, we have to keep in mind this is a post-war um, environment too. And drunk people are simultaneously very funny and comical, but also you have that very tragic component and, and side to it too. Yeah. Anyway, but um, what what other what other films can you guys think about that have this kind of single, like more or less monothematic uh, day in the life? We've mentioned the the Lost Weekend and the Fire Within before. Is, are there any other? Well, Haas also made some more films that are in a similar way. I mean, I did see the Codes uh, a few days ago, which is about. Uh, which was his last black and white film, uh, which is a little bit similar. It's about a father who hasn't seen his children in 20 plus years. He didn't return after World War II, and uh, uh, one of his sons, who was a child at the time, was most likely killed during the occupation, and he comes back, he tries to figure out what happened, uh, happened to him, and it has a similar kind of dreamlike vague atmosphere we don't really know what happened there's all these kind of indications he runs into all of these various people who are telling him stories uh, about his son do you feel like there are actually some other polish films in the same way i guess innocent sorcerers by Veda. it's also kind of like just a little bit more real time but like also just about someone moving from the apartment and out into the street uh, etc. So you have these films, but I, I agree, it's one of the most powerful works that kind of just is so simple. A man is in his apartment, he leaves, he encounters people, and, and he comes back. That's more or less uh, like the trajectory of the narrative, but uh, there's just so much depth within it. And as we said, loops within loops within loops. If film is always feel to be circling in on itself, clocks are circular, references to loops are made just throughout. And another film that really plays with a similar kind of circular logic, uh, if you will, is his uh, largest epic, probably his best regarded film. We'll jump seven years into the future with the Saragossa manuscript, that kind of gift wrapped box of stories within stories, as two men on different sides of a war get captivated by a book and transported into a world of an army officer in Spain who gets drawn into dreamlike encounters with possible seductive specters and gets equally transfixed in stories and stories within these stories. Three hours long, this is Haas's longest epic and his second to last film in black and white, really showcasing the 
power uh, he could get out of black and white rituals with his more uh, outlandish set design and props, because this is a film just filled with skulls and dead bodies wherever you look. There's this kind of grotesque nature to it all. Uh, and it's just ritually spectacular, darkly comedic, and just all out crazy. When I watched it, I, I really couldn't help but compare it to a lot of the films by Terry Gilliam. <laughs> and uh, when I was pushing uh, this film on Saul, I really thought he'd love it uh, as well. But uh, you were a bit less um, in awe of this one than us. Uh, what was your experience with the Saragossa manuscript, Saul? The Saragossa Mon- Manuscript was a difficult film to try and process after having previously watched The Hourglass Sanatorium. So what happened, the uh, genesis of this whole podcast episode is that on the forum I wanted to choose something special for my, my number 12,000 first time viewing, and I went with The Hourglass Sanatorium, which I absolutely loved. And then Chris said, how would you feel about doing a podcast on Huss? And I'm like, well, I already saw the news earlier this year, and now I've seen the sanatorium, so I've only got the manuscript left to watch. So I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll go ahead with it. So I went into the film with quite high expectations because I absolutely love the Hourglass Sanatorium, which for me is really Gilliam-esque. To me, the Sarah Gosa manuscript is sort of less like that. I mean, it is sort of in bits and pieces, but a lot of it isn't because much of the film is just about this idea of stories within stories within stories. You've got these two officers from opposing sides of this uh, battle who go and read this manuscript together, and then it's about one of their grandfathers, and then it's about the grandfather hearing stories, the hearing stories within stories and other stories, and... I guess for me, I just find that whole dynamic quite, I guess, exhausting. I wish there was a better way to put it. And what I found most fascinating about the film was there were these places where he sort of trips in and out of reality. So he sort of drinks from a poison chalice, which I guess could be a link to the noose maybe and the loss of time. So he drinks from the poison chalice and he suddenly wakes up and he's grilled by the Spanish Inquisition. And then suddenly he's back and going back and forth. And I found that all really interesting. And the initial location in which the main guy within the story, within the manuscript, is drawn to is amazing. It's this inner room, which is like inside this castle, like housed away, and there's like these two beautiful women there, and you're not sure how much is real and how much is not real. But for me, I wish more of the film was sort of about that, about the strange locations like that and about the real and not real in there. I mean, there are some pretty great quotes in there where he talks about not knowing where reality ends and where fantasy begins. There's another great part where somebody says to him, only an ignorant only an ignorant man thinks that he understands what he sees. And all those things for me are really interesting, but for me, I guess most of the film wasn't really about that. It wasn't really about the surreal parts, or else I guess the hourglass sanatorium for me is a completely surreal film through and through. It's completely about tripping in and out of reality and about fantasy blurs the entire way around, whereas this A Ghost of Manuscript is more about telling stories within stories within stories. And I guess probably the clincher for me is that at the end of it, there is a bit of a reveal. I don't want to say what the reveal is because I don't want to spoil it, but that for me was also a bit of a letdown. So look, overall, I didn't dislike the film, but I guess it was hard not to enter with high expectations. Chris was talking it up before the episode. I know it's more acclaimed than the Hourglass Sanatorium, but while watching it, the comparison that came to mind for me is actually Andre Rublev by Tarkovsky. And for anybody who's listened to the Tarkovsky podcast, for me, that's not actually a compliment. I sort of feel that the Hourglass Sanatorium is like Solaris for me, a film which I'm totally engaged with. And for me, like Andre Rublev, I sort of feel the Sagosa manuscript is sort of like a stepping stone. Or what I wrote in my letterbox review, I actually wrote that it's sort of like a dry run. It felt to be like a dry run for what it would actually accomplish later on in the 70s. So I'm sorry for the negativity. And I'll let you guys uh, completely go ahead and 
talk about all the virtues, all the things that are so great about it, and all the things that I've obviously missed in my viewing of it. <laughs> well, uh, first, first of all, good comparison with uh, Andre Rublev. I mean, uh, there are different, there are different films in a, in a way. Uh, the atmosphere is different. Uh, one is very overtly surreal. Uh, the other one is, I guess more ethereal but those those things can be kind of similar uh, as well they're both just these grand huge black and white epics uh, with multiple stories so uh, it's a very very good comparison uh, and i will actually agree with some of your critique i mean i think that the first layer this story of the officer who encounters these two uh, very seductive african princesses who tells him that uh, they want uh, him to be their husband, but then they disappear, and there's skulls everywhere, and it seems like it, they're ghosts. It seems like death is all around. He hears calls. He he gets like you said, he gets captured. He gets spun back every time he meets them. He wakes up next to dead bodies, and people tell him that ghosts are about. It's just this, uh, this very macabre. And again, overtly surreal, a nightmarish tale. That's very interesting to me. And, and that part of the film is an absolute favorite as far as I'm concerned. Like, if that was the whole film, it would be uh, ranked very high on my list of favorites. But these stories within stories, they can feel like they are trailing off a little bit. Like, in, in the first, because it's a film in two two parts. In the first part, all of the stories kind of seems to come back to itself. Like, it's a story, like, some of the stories are about the officer's father, and the father marries his mother, which is kind of his connection. Like, she comes as if she's a uh, gift from the devil, almost, and kind of connects him to these specters. And then you have the stories of an other man who went into the, uh, the same inn he did, and had different visions also of two uh two uh, two sisters and he gets he has a similar experience so all of that kind of builds into itself but in the second half you get like almost 50 minutes at least tales of stories and stories and stories about seemingly completely unrelated tale it's still about the macabre it's still about that it's still about you know a potential uh devil uh, interference etc but that's just like i was watching that now and like well, how, how long is it again until <laughs> we get back to the main story so, and that did lower my uh, my love for the film a little bit so yeah i can definitely see where uh, you are coming from I, I mean at one point i counted that there's six levels of stories within stories <laughs> I yeah, they say, I think six is as as big as a. I mean, as as deep as the that the, this rabbit hole goes. But I I mean, and and yeah, I I agree. There's this huge component of a, a gothic and macabre and a memento mori. Uh, I mean, this is a film that probably has the greatest abundance of skulls of any I've seen. But uh, so there is this incessant memento mori. Uh, um, uh, side to it, he he wakes up uh, from his dreams at uh, uh, always at the gallows. So there, these, there is this constant reminder of death and and the struggle with 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 it. But I personally, I also feel there's a huge playful side to the film. I mean, this this obviously this embedded narrative, this casket like uh, matryoshka doll um, structure of nested layers uh, and stories within stories you know you find you find a book that tells the story of someone recounting his dream and 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 who reads another book and you just go you can you, this this is the gimmick you know it's it's and it's inherently metatextual the, the form of the film it draws attention to its own artifice and this allows for this kind of precariousness and and you know the, the possibilities for infinite perpetuations you know you could just continue going on uh in dreams within dreams books within books and all that but i think there is a huge playful side as a result of that places and and, and, and names and they just remind me of don quixote as well it has that kind of burlesqueness to it it's like a baroque messiness and and a lot of jokes that are said 
and and it deals inherently also with knights and chivalry and adventures and i, I don't know I, love, I just love this film i think it's full of of beautiful of beautiful uh charts and and, and the, the music i have to really compliment the music as well and but by the uh with uh, it's uh, christoph penderecki that, that made the music a well-renowned classical composer and he really used a lot of uh, he, he used these bubbly uh synthy um electronic tones and, and really has a kind of trepidation and there's a lot of there's a bunch of classical music as well and i actually feel like the playfulness and and gimmicky side of the film comes up in the very first chart it's like the opening credits they they're set to beethoven's ninth symphony which talks about freedom among all people but then the, the very the very first shot is a war going on <laughs> and there's a bunch of humor in it as well like when the opposite parties, the parties they actually find the book in in one of the houses that's it's like and despite the war going on he's oh yeah close the door because it's uh, there's a cold air coming inside <laughs> close the door right? like no yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, all around right I mean, that opening scene is probably one of the most Guillemesque uh, things he's ever done. I mean, I, I wonder if uh, Gilliam was inspired by this for the opening scenes in Baron Munchausen, where you have similar kind of explosions in this. Like, the humor that comes from how ridiculous uh, and dark it all is. I mean, there's just have all, uh, this military man just running into battle, being blown up, and you have this, uh, like, lead for, like, ten minutes, kind of being both a coward and a hero uh, at once, like, first hiding, and then he's yelling, like, charge with me, as everyone else is running away. <laughs> and uh, when uh, the uh, enemy uh, arrives, and they kind of takes over, he's reading this book, he's so captivated, and it's like, you're under arrest, you know, Caesar, we will kill you, and it's like, oh, just a second, please, I'm reading this really interesting book, and then everyone circles around him and kind of bends down to look at it, too, it's a very bizarre opener. Something that I might just say, I was going to mention it before, but with Carmel waxing poetic about the film, it just brought it to mind also. Uh, other than Andre Rublev, because... I guess the comparison being a long black and white film with all these different stories and very episodic. Uh, the other comparison piece that came to mind for me was Inception, where the whole idea of, you know, dreams within dreams within dreams. In the Sagosa manuscript, you have stories within stories within stories. And I know that Khan was quite a big fan of Inception, so I'm actually not surprised he's also quite a big fan of the Sagosa manuscript. Inception obviously equally exploits this embedded narrative structure but I'm, I'm surprised you guys haven't mentioned uh Benuel yet i think the saragossa manuscript is often described as being a very Benuel-esque film but i agree about terry terry gilliam so chris you can see kind of these these touches yeah actually i have to say like despite it's an elite polish cast but the film was wasn't that greatly received in poland it just had walkouts because people were getting bored i guess by the the dryness of it but the, so there's there is a there's a sometimes a dryness there but it's also just hugely complicated because you get lost in this lab of, of matryoshka dolls around the nested layers but you but this 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 wandering this this mix of temptations and capacity for sin and that's contrasted with like the christian aesthetic kind of restraint and all of the knights uh values and honor as well i would not be surprised if nolan had seen this film and uh the reception of it outside of Poland was actually uh, it quickly became a cult, a cult classic, and you know it was revered by so many people. Scorsese, Coppola, and and David Lynch have all said this is a this is, was a huge inspirational film. And do, do you guys felt that there was a Benoit esque kind of side to this film? And what kind of Benoit film, films would you f think about? Well, that's a good question. I didn't really think that much about Benoit while I was watching the film. I think. If I were going to draw parallels, it would probably be to some of his uh, older Mexican period films, like Mexican Bus Ride, for instance, which kind of also blends reality and is more spectacular. I mean, obviously, Bunuel can be very episodical. Like, you have films like uh, The Milky Way or <laughs> The Phantom of Liberty, etc. But uh, his type of surrealism tends to feel... A little different, at least, at least to me. I didn't really get much of a Buñuel vibe from the film either. However, I did read in the film's trivia section that apparently uh, Buñuel saw the film three times, which was unusual because he was notorious or well-known, depending on how you want to put it, for only ever watching films once. So that's an interesting tidbit. So obviously it definitely 
vibed well with him. But while watching the film, yeah, it wasn't actually a connection that I consciously made. Yeah. I've heard it's been a long time since I've seen Benuel things, but maybe that's just a kind of Spanish, a Spanish language connection, given that this film is set in, in Spain. However, speaking of language, like uh, I've already mentioned, this is an elite for this for the 1960s is an elite combination of actors. But something very interesting that perhaps non non Polish speakers uh, can't get is that the Polish voices they they speak of the characters in the sense that some some of the actors they purposely uh, exaggerate their voice in a very unnatural kind of sounding way, and and other characters they speak in is very serious, dignified, poetic manner as if they were, you know, well, as they actually are characters in a, in a book or in a film for this case, but they, they speak in these unnaturally long, again, from a Don, Don Quixote-esque monologues and tone of the voices really separates the, the, the people that consider themselves noble and dignified and those that are just ridiculous, right? The film plays a part with identities as well, and Benuel is a, sometimes a, just a, ref, a, it's a reference. He also deals with like a kind of asceticism that comes up here. The, the Chilean, Raul Ruiz. The Saragossa manuscript feels like his kind of film in, in many ways as well. Just this layering, this questioning authenticity of each scene, of each tale. Is this, yeah, just this insane labyrinth-esque structure. But I think I think Chris has seen many more uh, Raul Ruiz films than me, so maybe you wanna you wanna mention a few, or perhaps if you if you think this one inspired uh, any of his work. Well, I haven't really thought of uh, that connection before, but in terms of just multiple stories intersecting in this kind of surrealism, then yes, I can definitely see similarities. As for films that are similar to this, I'm not. 100% sure. Maybe something like Three Lives and Only One Death, for instance, which kind of blends r reality and fantasy and the multi-story arcs in, in a similar way. But then I can't think of an exact match. But yeah, definitely, if you love Ruiz, uh, you should check out Haas and vice versa. That, that, that's an easy recommendation. And uh, similarly, if you love Gilliam, uh, you should probably check out Haas as well, because there's there's a lot of similarities between uh, these directors, and if he loves realism, I think that Haas is one of those uh, directors you just need to start exploring. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, this is a he ha, Haas is a is a, is a must see for for any surrealist fans and fans of maximalist set designs and and and, and colorful designs. And I have to also mention, I, I was really taken by as this this is a small it's a small detail, but I was really quite taken with. It was a very interesting kind of. Uh, abrupt cut. There's some demons chasing a man, and at some point they just teleport away, and there's just this abrupt cut of them just disappearing off the screen. I, I was just, that, that just instantly reminded me of Inland Empire and a lot of silent films as well, right? And there's this kind of eeriness that comes out of uh, just people disappearing like that. And I haven't seen that. I haven't encountered that a lot again. So. Uh, that was interesting to see. And the, the, I think I think the film is accomplished on on every level. And the next film, The Hour of Glass Sanatorium, that has an explosion of detail and intricacy on, on screen. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we've been talking about loops a lot, circular logic, dreamlike experiences, imagination, Gilliam connections, lavish set designs, all of this stuff. And uh, like, like Sol mentioned earlier, The Hour of Glass Sanatorium, really is the cream of the crop but when, when it just comes to just mad surrealism this living dream that is simultaneously both uh, a nightmare and fantastical as uh, our protagonist arrives at a sanatorium um, even, even his arrival there it, it, it feels ethereal, like you see these long pants over people on a train, they seem dead, they're lavishly clothed, um, but the atmosphere is just so airy and the shots are fantastic. He arrives at the sanitarium, everything's collapsing. Once again, the soul's earlier references to Solaris and this kind of decay and, and just vastness of uh, just imagination within that is decay. Such a great uh, comparison point. 
Yeah, our protagonist is informed that time works differently here. His father, who died in his native land, is alive here. He just doesn't know he's dead because time is, I suppose, moving backwards. Though it's never exactly explained how this time prism works. And before we know it, our lead is just consumed in a world where nothing is as it seems to be. He can open one door and enter an entirely different world. He's back in his childhood town. He meets, he like, he, he removes like a, a, like a cloth from a chair and his mother is there. <laughs> um, he puts on an army hat and suddenly he's pulled into like a colonial uh, setting or like an army setting. Everything here, it spirals for spirals of crawling under beds coming out somewhere else. You never know exactly what is going on. It's just fantastically shot. The color work here is phenomenal and everything is simultaneously Fun, off, very eerie. Uh, it's just a perfect mix of a surreal head trip. And and since this was uh, your favorite of the three, Saul, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you love about the Hourglass Sanatorium? I guess the key for me about the Hourglass Sanatorium is that while the Sagosa manuscript is more based on fantasy or is more fantasy aligned. The Hourglass Sanatorium is sort of more sci-fi aligned. So what you said before about the idea about playing around with time, that for me is absolutely fascinating. He goes, he visits his father who is his long abandoned left in the sanatorium and he's found out that the doctors have found this way to uh, reactivate or I think also the word they used are uh, something like that. They reactivate or they go back into the past with all its possibilities, including recovery. So they manage to get his father to get better by sort of reversing time. And then the doctor's talking about relativity, relativity and being unable to precisely define what time is. You've got a nurse there who comments that it's always daytime in the place. And I guess there's a little bit of anxiety in there which i really like it's really like when filmmakers do anxiety well because yes he's going on this surreal head trip journey where he's going in and out of his memories and he seems to be going back into the past every time he opens a door or a gate or jumps over a wall he goes to a different spot in his life but a lot of it for me all sort of played out with the idea that he's abandoned his father at this place he's finally going to visit it the place is completely like dilapidated, overgrown. You've got vines coming inside the building. And you've got these doctors and nurses going on about these crazy feelings. And I just sort of felt that the main guy in the film was maybe a little bit wrapped with guilt or a little bit of anxiety that he's left it, left the care of his father to these strangers who seem to have these absolutely bonkers theories. And as we're going throughout the course of the film, I wasn't sure much of this is his memory, whether he's going back in time, or whether everything is sort of, what's the word for it? Everything sort of brought on by his anxiety, his uncertainty, and his mixed emotions about having left his father to the care of these really strange and wacky people. But beyond all that, yeah, it's the most Gilliam-esque uh, film of the three that we're discussing today from Haas. And, yeah, it's just beyond the, the uh, sets, the uh, tr tripping in and out of reality and different times. And also, it's a colour film, like you mentioned. The colours are amazingly bright and vivid, and I guess maybe that's the counterpoint and why I prefer the visuals of this one to the Sagosa manuscript is everything's in those vibrant colours. And it's not, like, super vibrant. It's just it makes the imagery really stand out. Everything for that train right at the start there, where it's sort of focusing on that window and the camera's coming out. Just all the parts where he's sort of like jumping in between different parts as he's progressing through his memories or maybe different rooms within the building and it's all uncertain and clear. Yeah, it's just an incredibly interesting and dynamic film and it's one that left an impression on me and I was thinking about it still days afterwards and I, I just could not recommend it further as a film which I guess doesn't just maybe inspired Gilead, but a film which maybe even had an impact on 
A Cure for Wellness. I don't know if it's a bit of an obscure reference to drop in there, but the Gore Vabinsky film, or even something like maybe Shutter Island to a degree, where you're sort of going into the sanatorium where things might not be quite right, and it's sort of about the protagonist processing his own thought patterns in the same space. We well, don't know, I'm rambling on here at the moment, but yeah, I'll let somebody else chime in. I mean, yeah, I have to I have to say, like, obviously, colour is something that really stands out in this film. Yeah, and Bruno Schulz is also considered one of the greatest Polish writers, and he has a very ornate literary style where he will bombard you with, like, five different metaphors and, and comparisons within one sentence all of the time. But his short stories are really, really unique. They have this dreamlike, onary quality to them, and colour is hugely important. Bruno Schulz was himself a, a, a painter as well, so he had a dual side and all of his short stories, they're also about artists and childhood. And how, where does he see artistry and, and meaning? He finds it in childhood. And so this film is also about like um, the protagonist as he tries to find the republic of dreams. He tries to find his way back to childhood. But all of it is also, again, a struggle with, with death. And obviously the figure, one of the very important figures in anyone's life, his father, his father's death. But in the sanatorium, he's still alive. How, how, how does it work that they violated these structures of times? The Tarkovsky comparisons, I think, are very apt. Like, there's this kind of zone and hypnotic vortex. Yeah, I think you're very, very right there. And uh, I mean, it's one of those films that are just so spectacular in its visuals and individual scenes that it's hard not to just get caught up in just the spectacular nature of it all. And that's probably where, you know, the Gilliam uh, comparisons come in a lot too. I mean, I, I read one assessment of uh, the film, uh, which was that rather than being a straight adaptation of the book, uh, because like uh, you mentioned, Carmel, it is uh, based on a very famous book by Bruno Schulz. Um, Haas also included some of his older writings, and apparently he tried to not uh, not really adapt the book, but adapt the feeling of the book. And one really lovely quote is always that I didn't just adapt it straightforward, he adapted the imagination of the writer and just really brought it all onto the screen. And uh, this imagination is obviously also what uh, Gilliam worked with in his Imagination Trilogy, so that's a really strong connection between uh, these works, but like for, for all of the rather grotesque imagery, like it's not as many skulls as in uh, the Saragossa Manuscript, as you mentioned, Carmel, Saragossa Manuscript probably has the most skulls I've ever seen in, in a film, like I, mean, I wonder if there's like a Guinness World Record of most skulls, or if there's like a, a list of films that show the most skulls, and, and, and that would be great to see. <laughs> but there's still skulls in here, there's still dead bodies, there's still all these grotesque elements. But these set pieces, like when he it disappears into these lavish dreams, fantasies, memories, whatever you want to call them, the excitement of this imaginary world, it can be felt. Like there's this dream, like almost childlike wonder, like when he puts on that uh, army cap and goes exploring, for instance. It, it really captures that feeling. And on the, on the flip side of that, there's also this kind of dread and like the walls are coming in around him and he's just getting more and more lost in this very scary world where nothing is uh, what it seems. It's just such a fantastic and dynamic quality to the film that I, I, I think it's why it's held up as the classic it is and why so many people fall in love with it. Another film beyond Gilliam and A Cure for Wellness and the Obvious Choices which the Hourglass Sanatorium brought to mind for me was actually The Wind Will Carry Us by Abbas Kiristami. It's sort of got a similar idea that you've got, well, in the Kiristami film, you've got this reporter going to this small village to make a documentary or report on, I can't remember exactly about this man who's dying, but as soon as he arrives there, the man who's dying keeps getting better and better and better. And I guess you've sort of got the same thing going on, that you've got the guy in the hourglass sanatorium go to the sanatorium. When he arrives there, he finds his father's getting better and better. And like with The Wind Will Carry Us, you've sort of got the guy then 
going and wandering between these strange and unusual structures and I guess sort of coming to a bit of an understanding about himself in the process. I mean, maybe it's overreaching. Maybe it's just the fact that I like the wind will carry us so much, but that was definitely an unusual and unexpected film to draw a comparison to. I mean, the Shutter Island and a Cure for Honor stuff, you know, they're both they're, they're sanatorium films. That's sort of expected. I wasn't really expecting to go into this film and have Kira Starmi come to mind for me. I've definitely thought of Shutter Island as well. And there's also a moment in the film when he's, after, despite, despite you know, all of these childhood explorations, at some point he, uh, he, he starts getting a bit paranoid about the sanatorium establishment and all the doctors. And he's, he's thinking that, that they're going to deceive him, that they're duping and deceiving him, and they want to hurt him and his father, actually, that they're not helping at all but keeping all of these people chained. But perturbed temporality that they live in and this the weird space this cluttered with, with with details and objects but seemingly abandoned nonetheless eerie space around them they're, they're just there's just really slow and lethargic in it everyone feels very drowsy very sleepy and they sleep a lot of the times uh, c- comes back to the saragossa manuscript and also to this connects back to the noose as well this idea and all the three films we trade us is waking up and not knowing how you got there so you feel this eeriness, this sense that things aren't all right, that you are in some, some, some lost parallel tracks. I mean, the film obviously starts with a weird kind of train, which is uh, mostly composed of empty carriages and people like really seeming like lost travelers as if they were in a, as if they were going to limbo, actually, or something, something like that, you know, passing to the next phase of existence. Yeah, absolutely. The sense that you're entering purgatory is uh, very real. And uh, as the doctor tells uh, our protagonist when he arrives, like uh, most of their patients, they don't know that they're already dead elsewhere. They don't know that they're even patients, which kind of sets us up that you know he's a patient as well. And we don't like that. We don't really know what uh, we're watching. He does know quite what he's experiencing, and it is just such a wild ride where you, you kind of feel like nothing is firm, everything's bendable and, and changing, and there's nothing to really grab a hold of. I, I do think you spent a lot of time praising this film, though, so is, is there anything in The Hourglass Sanatorium you feel brings it down a little bit in your estimation? Well, I obviously still think the the books are way superior. Actually, this is an attempt at not a straightforward adaptation of any one of the short stories, but it blends and combines little elements and little uh, scenes and ideas contained within the books that make for very that make for very striking, uh, vivid imagery. And the the film combines that and blends all of those little elements together. And as you as you said, it tries it attempts to recreate the imagination of the short stories. Which again, like, uh, is kind of re-emphasized in the, the, what's happening in, in the film as well, because there is a desire to to come back to the the realm of childhood and uh, the mystery and, and power and meaning that you can get from them. You have to grow up to become a child. There's a kind of two thousand one esque side of the to that. Actually, yeah, uh, two thousand one is not a bad uh, is a bad comparison. I think of it like the the, the last kind of Stargate. But what, what what brings it down? I me as a as a reader as well. I can't help but feel like my my own imagination as I'm inspired by the books is uh, more more potent, right? But the f- this is this is the only attempt at uh, a short adaptation. The only the only other two people that have ever attempted this sh- a short adaptation are the Quay Brothers with their animation film Streets of Crocodiles. Okay, so the Hourglass Sanatorium isn't a perfect ten for me, so. It's like about a high eight for me, so like eight towards nine out of ten. So there are a couple of minor reservations that I have about it. I guess one for me is that as a science fiction buff, I would have preferred more explanation about how they managed to turn back or reactivate the past and how they play around with time. And a lot of the film sort of plays out a bit like Slaughterhouse Fire with him getting unstuck in time, which is all incredibly interesting. But by the second half of the film, I guess I sort of felt it was more traveling through random memories rather than logical progression of memories. So I'd say maybe parts of the film were a little bit too random for my liking and 
I would have liked more hardcore sci-fi content in there. But as a film about a paranoid, anxiety-ridden protagonist who's at this strange place where his perceptions of everything is completely out of whack, where he's trusted these strangers to take care of his father, who might be more eccentric than he could have possibly imagined. Just so much of it did so much for me that, you know, I, re I really liked the film a lot. I uh, instantly inducted into my all-time top 1,000. So I do think it's an incredibly great film. But, yeah, there are a couple of minor things that maybe repeat reviewings would iron out for me and they wouldn't come as uh, so much of a minor disappointment. I do have to say minor because it is an incredibly uh, good film. It was such a great film that I agreed to do this podcast without even having <laughs> seen the three-hour black and white film beforehand, which ended up being a mild disappointment. Yeah, and that's very high praise. I mean, there's very few things that I would say that's negative about it as well. I think one small element that brought it down a little bit for me is that it, it almost feels, I'm not going to say juvenile, but there's there's this part of it where essentially every single woman in the film is sexualized and have their breasts out at some point and almost all of them are kind of this kind of sexual fantasy, which it works quite a bit actually, because you can kind of see like, okay, these are kind of like the wet dreams and nightmares of our protagonist, but it uh, was a little bit almost monotonous uh, in that part of the film, which is like just a little bit too much of that. But they're used in different ways, both for uh, more dark imagery and for fantasy. And they're in that hunger for childhood within the film, there are some other elements too that I thought were a not quite silly, but bordering on that. But this is an absolute favorite for me. I, I think I might be the one that likes it the most of all three of us then. And I do think that it, as, as a real work, and I, I did just a great masterpiece, it's a film that should belong on almost any short list, no matter how short of you know, the must-see real films. Like if you trim that list down to 510, Darugla Sanatorium could be there. It's one of those films that just has to be seen by anyone interested in surrealism or just mad films. I, I actually didn't think of it as, as a sci-fi film at all. I thought it was more of uh, like a fantasy film or a purgatory film. So that, that might be why that lack of sci-fi explanations uh, was, was not bothering uh, me. I wouldn't say it really even bothered me that much. It's just, you know, sort of when I'm looking at, do I put in the top half of my top 1,000 films or the bottom half, you know, that sort sort of like kicked it down a bit further. But, you know, it's fine. I've only seen it the one time. I only saw it five weeks ago. There's, now that it's actually out there on streaming, I don't have to import a DVD from overseas. It's going to be much easier for me to rewatch in the future. And I think it's one of those films that's only likely to go up in my estimation. Yeah, great to hear that. And I'm so happy that essentially every Haas film is also properly restored now too i mean i think the first time i saw this this was i saw this like 12 13 years ago for the first time and i don't i think that was on a dvd and it didn't look as great as it does now so and i also saw all of uh, haas's 80s films uh, this last week and they just look spectacular as well and so uh, I, I have to thank you for accepting this episode to just inspire me to just continue because i just with this rewatch i got so excited that i tried to see almost every film by Haas, <laughs> except Lalka, which I hope will get the restoration at some point. I mean, you know, Lalka, arguably the greatest Polish novel ever written, right? So, and you have to read it, it's cool. So, weirdly enough, I think the most famous film by Haas is unintentionally Lalka, which everyone, every student, every Polish student that doesn't want to <laughs> is actually watching on YouTube in the worst possible quality <laughs> just to get some on the plot. But I don't, I didn't, I didn't watch it in total. I've just seen some scenes and clips of it, but an incredible book. So you can see all, all of his films are actually to some extent literary adaptations. So it's very interesting how he, you know, he's known as this great visual director. And, you know, even though all of his novels are literary, I mean, he, he has a penchant of choosing good, ambitious projects. And well, now I guess I guess now we're kind of uh, talking about it in general and uh, doing a roundup of his uh, filmography. right? But I will, my question to you is whether his other films are equally ambitiously surreal. I, I would say his career is almost a bit split in two. It, it's like a before Saragossa manuscript and after uh, Saragossa manuscript. So 
all of his films have these real touches, like you mentioned. But if you watch something like One Room Tenants, which is his third film, is absolutely great. That's very contained to one location. It's very dialogue based. You still have that atmosphere, but it is more straightforward. And uh, all of his like, early 60s films, they do toy with surrealism. They really bring in the atmosphere, but they are more connected to reality. They're closer to the norm of uh, you know the great uh, Polish directors of the time. I mean, why that toyed a little bit with uh, surrealism too? So it, they are more restrained, if you will. Uh, and the codes which he made after the Sarah Gossam manuscript, that fits into that mold as well, where you have some actual dreams or visions in it, and the atmosphere and where it's going is vague, but it can be read very straightforward, and most of what happens, happens. Uh, I haven't seen Lalka. And I, like, I am getting more picky. We, ha- we have an episode on image quality, which is probably going to be released <laughs> before this one, where I say that, you know, I'm not jumping on terrible uh, prints anymore. I- I'm waiting for the restorations now as much as possible. And being a hoss, uh, I'm going to wait uh, for-, for Lalka to just get that proper 4K <laughs> treatment. But all of the films he made after the Hourglass uh, Sanatorium they are ambitious like that. I, I have read conflicting things about what happened after Hourglass Sanatorium because there was a ban on the f- uh, film from being exported, at least to Cannes. I'm not sure if it's overseas in general because the authorities and the censors, they didn't like it. They thought that, you know, the decaying uh, sanatorium was a commentary on uh, the institutions and the bureaucracy in Poland. So they were very dismissive. It wasn't banned in Poland. It got a theatrical release, but it just didn't really want it to be seen elsewhere and the reception was very poor. Um, <laughs> But the horse smuggled it to come against the mandate against it, and it won the jury prize. And what I read is that because of that, he couldn't start directing another film for eight years. I'm not sure if that's because he was actively directly banned or like more of a subtle blacklist. But I mean, he didn't release another film for another ten years, and those films are in a slightly smaller scope. It's kind of like he's getting his footing again, and. Uh, like he had to work his way back up, which is a little bit sad. The first film he did after he uh, came back, he came back, was actually a Chekhov adaptation. So it's a little bit closer to his earlier films again. It was an adaptation of an uneventful story, um, which is more dialogue driven, but the visual style is the same as in the Hourglass Sanatorium. So when he has these conversations, it still feels like it has this nightmarish uh, tension and you're not quite sure what you're watching. And while the sets aren't as lavish and it's not as overtly surreal, it has that atmosphere and it really elevated uh, that film for me. And then the surrealism really comes back uh, full throttle but again, you kind of feel like the budgets aren't quite as large. I mean, Sarah Gossam manuscript is a huge epic. The Hourglass Sanatorium is a huge epic, even though it's just two hours. I mean, Hall spent five years making that film. Interestingly, the film we did after an eventful story was a film called Right and Fight, which is probably the film I would recommend the most to Saul because it's like a micro Hourglass Sanatorium uh, and uh, possibly a commentary on what happened after the Hourglass Sanatorium because it follows a satirist who gets thrown in jail for breaking moral laws and he's never formally charged. They keep coming up with new charges against him and he starts to get delirious in his cell. He sees visions and time starts to lapse. It's more straightforward. It's not as visually spectacular, but it has that bureaucracy angle that I know Saul loves. And uh, it, it just has a lot of similarities to the Hourglass Sanatorium. And then he finally went just all out to real again. Memoirs of a Sinner is probably one of his four or five best films. It's not as great as the three we're talking about today, but it's more contained. It's just visually stunning. It's as visually accomplished as essentially any of his films. It's in color. All of his these four films are in color. And it's just really playful, carefree, where you just, I once again, don't know what's real, what's not, what's fantasy, what's fiction, what's madness. And uh, that's the same th- kind of things he brought on to his very final film, uh, The Tribulation of Baltasar Coburn from 1988, 
which is about this young kind of less intelligent boy whose whole family has died during the Red Death. Uh, it's kind of just wandering around. He has fantastical visions of meeting the Archangel Gabriel, meeting ghosts, people disappear. You don't know if it's his mindset or reality. Uh, and uh, Michael Lonsdale is in it, or Michelle Lonsdale is in it, which is just uh, <laughs> absolutely wonderful. So he has a huge role as his kind of odd, almost uh, magical uh, kind of mentor character in it, in his top build. So that that's uh, it's not as strong as uh, some of these other films. But but visually spectacular, this, all of these films are definitely worth seeking out for fans of Hauser's work and just for fans of surrealism in general. Cheers for those. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely keen on uh, seeing his other works. And uh, I'll, I'll, I will watch his other works with this uh, through the lens of uh, some of the things that we were talking about today. Do you, you know the, the Polish authorities also supposedly didn't allow the news to be released uh, internationally? It's not like there was a complete ban on the film, on these films. But yeah, as you said, they, they didn't want to export them out because communist regimes, sometimes they, they don't want the, the country to be portrayed in any kind of negative sense, right? So yeah, <laughs> yeah we can't have people think there's alcoholics in this country. Yeah, um, but well, the po Polish, Polish artists have a longstanding problem with the communist regime. Um, do you think that based on these threes, do you feel like you can really, you can say Haas is somewhat of an auteur, or if, can you f you can recognize that these are these works were made by the same director with a vision, despite it being inspired by so many different authors and books and taking on these ambitious literary adaptation projects. Yeah, obviously. I mean, I think uh, when when you come to calling someone an auteur, I think Haas has uh, <laughs> a pretty good claim. I mean, especially from Saragossa Manuscript and onwards, like all of his films, the way he works with uh, sets and angles, um, it's very easy to tell that uh, it, it's him. But, but even in the films before that, uh, and you mentioned, you, you asked, like, is there a connection? Like, these three films in particular, they are really connected by the kind of circular, almost dreamlike atmosphere. So th th there always seems to be loops. There always seems to be these questions of reality. What's real? What's not? We don't know. Like fr from, th from the news uh, and uh, until uh, his very last film, you have this idea like, are these people specters? Like, is it realistic in the news that his uh, former flame would just randomly meet him in this uh, uh, coffee shop? Like, is that bus crash realistic? Are these encounters uh, truly real in the same way? Like, or is it something heightened? And that's something that continues, but it, as he, I guess, suppose developed, and as he get, got, also got more artistic freedom, as color came in, though that sense of visuals and storytelling he did, that they do become more and more entrenched in itself but that that's quite common for authors or uh, for authors isn't it that you know they they start off with a kind of sense of who they are and then they just develop it f more and more and more uh, and uh, in that way Haas is definitely a very unique and strong voice i guess maybe i should answer this question first because whether i can call him an author based on these three films i'm gonna say no I mean, like I said before, I can see how the Sagosa manuscript is sort of a bit of a stepping stone to the Hourglass Sanatorium with some of the tripping in and out of reality and the dilapidated sets. But seeing those two films and I guess my memories of the noose, I'd say, yeah, look, it's, it, it's really hard for me. I feel like I'm sort of like clutching at straws to try and find connections between them. I'm sure, though, if, like Chris, I'd see more of his work, I'd be able to make strong connections. But at this stage, all I can say is that he makes interesting films. I don't know if I can really say more beyond that without being exposed to more of them. And that one that Chris mentioned that he thought that I would like, I will take note of that, and maybe I will try and watch that sometime in the near future. Excellent. Yeah, I hope you enjoy it. As long as I end up liking it more than Sagosa Manuscript, I'll be happy. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, it's more restrained, but yeah, I think I think so. I think you like it more than Sergio's the manuscript. I mean, the same goes for memoirs of a sinner, honestly. I think that oh, there's this opening scene in that uh, film where you don't have these uh, corpses coming out of their graves. I think you get a great rush out of that. Uh, after that, it kind of uh, tones down the badness and the nightmarish elements a little bit, but you instill there's such a wacky. Uh, uh, 
a new show, maybe not new show for Haas, but just this uh, surreal uh, dreamlike film. So I, I think you'd enjoy that one a lot too. And uh, on that note, and uh, with some recommendations for, for Saul, <laughs> uh, I think that's a very good time to uh, end this episode. I hope that our listeners uh, got some recommendations from this episode as well. If you haven't seen any of Haas's films, Based on your preferences, I'd probably say it's best to either start with the news, if you prefer classic uh, films or classic Polish films in particular, or the Hourglass Sanatorium if you're more into surreal films. And uh, with that, thank you so much for listening, and join us again soon. You have been listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of ICMforum.com. 